Which foods are gonna boost my mood? Everyone has that specific comfort food that they go to, right? But this isn't really about, oh, I'm happy because I got ice cream versus I'm sad because I don't have ice cream. It's much deeper than that. This is about the bacteria in our bellies and that's called the gut microbiome. Scientists say that more than half our bodies is not actually made up of human cells, but made of microbes. I mean, I'm talking bacteria, viruses, fungi. So if you think about it, we're actually more microbe than human. But before you get too alarmed, remember, we think of bacteria as a bad thing. However, there's good bacteria too. And it's the balance of this good bacteria versus bad bacteria that has these scientists so excited. Now, we're only at the very, very beginning of understanding the role bacteria plays in our bodies, but it's already transforming the way we think about diseases like Parkinson's, allergies, and even mental health. And this takes us to Ireland, where scientists are at the forefront of exploring the connection between our mental health and the food that we put in our gut. Here in the intestines, we have these trillions of microbes. And uh, what we're trying to do is try to understand how our diet is affecting the composition of these microbes uh, to influence what's going on in the brain. The large intestine is like a big fermenter producing hundreds or perhaps thousands of molecules, many of which get into the bloodstream and are capable of communicating with the brain. Research shows that healthy gut bacteria can actually produce neurotransmitters. And these are the small chemicals which send messages in our brain and our nervous system. We use the term psychobiotic to describe bacteria which have a positive mental health benefit. So this raised an intriguing question. Can a diet which increases healthy gut bacteria actually improve our mental health? Can what I put in my gut actually make me happier? So, to test this out, we recruited eight healthy volunteers with the help of nutritional expert, Dr. Kirsten Birding Harrell. Thank, you. Thank Hi, Kirsten. you for coming in today. Steve and Sean both suffer from stress and anxiety and also eat unhealthily. At the moment, um, I do eat a lot of takeaway, uh, very fast food. A lot of sugary, sugar, sugary foods. Um, like for my breakfast this morning, I would have had Nutella and toast. The volunteers are split into two groups. Steve is in the control group and will continue a regular diet, whereas Sean is in the experimental group and will be put on a psychobiotic diet. And this is the diet with the gut bacteria linked to good mental health. This diet consists of two main types of foods, prebiotics and probiotics. And this comes from stuff which are foods rich in fibre and fermented foods. Am I allowed to eat, you know, a takeaway of, of one night a week or something like that? So we, we want you to stay away from the fast food. Okay. We want you to eat healthy, homemade food. Takeaway kills your bacteria, so okay. um, th you should stay away from those during the month. Okay. They follow these diets for four weeks, but not before Steve and Sean give stool samples so we can measure their gut bacteria and then they're given a mood questionnaire so we can assess their well-being. Then, for the next four weeks, half our group will eat normally and half of them will switch to a psychobiotic diet. Like I would have never eaten whole wheat pasta before. I've never eaten any, any seeds before, do you know, never mind putting them into a, into a dish, so it's, it's definitely a change for me, but it's a good change. And then it's time to hear the results. First, the bacteria in their gut. We took a, a poo sample to look at what was going on uh, in the microbiome and uh, we found that there was a remarkable change, e even in such a short period of time, in the composition of the microbiome. We don't see that in the control diet, unfortunately. Within four weeks of a psychobiotic diet, it's already led to a better mix of healthy bacteria in our volunteers' gut. More good bacteria, less bad. So, question is, how has this affected their mental health? What well, we find very clearly that those on the psychobiotic diet have much less uh, stress compared to those on the control diet. Excitingly, the mood questionnaires showed that our volunteers on the psychobiotic diet felt significantly less stressed. And as a further measure of their mental state, we're actually having their response to stress tested and their response fell by about 31% on average. Although this was a very small study, the results are consistent with others. And this demonstrates a clear link between the specific foods we eat and our mental health. However, that doesn't mean this is an easy diet to follow. Okay, 
Mm. Eee. Ooh. So let's look deeper into what is a psychobiotic diet and which foods will boost my mood. Prebiotic foods are foods that are rich in fiber and known to help feed healthy gut bacteria. So we're talking about whole grains, onions, leeks, and berries. Probiotics are foods full of healthy bacteria. So we're talking about fermented foods such as kefir, sauerkraut, kombucha, kimchi, as well as probiotic yogurts. And fortunately, we have three of them here. We got some kefir, some kimchi, and some kombucha. And I haven't actually tried these, so here's to hoping these are as good on my taste buds as they are to my gut health. Oh, ha! Well, <laughs> here's hoping. I feel like some of this may take some getting used to. Mm. Delicious. That hits the spot. My gut feels better already. <laughs> oh my god. Nah, you have to try this. You have to try this. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I can just about deal with the kimchi. The two drinks are terrible. The key thing to remember here is our understanding of the gut microbiome and its link to mental health, like many things, is still in its infancy. So make sure you're looking out for new research coming soon. And guys, this doesn't mean you can never ever again have your favorite fast food or cheat meal, but just remember, looking after your gut bacteria is good for not only your body, but your mind as well. Welcome to Brit Lab. Today we're asking, are modern trendy milk substitutes healthier than cow's milk? Drinking milk is weird, let's face it. Animals don't continue to do it after weaning, but we humans can't get enough of the stuff. In fact, we consume a massive 250 billion litres of it every year worldwide. But not everyone's a fan. Veganism is on the rise and a whopping 65% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. It's not as big a problem in Europe, but these days milk is still a hot topic. Lactose is a sugar found in milk. When milk hits our gut, an enzyme called lactase helps break the lactose up, and this helps us to digest the milk. A lack of this enzyme is what makes people lactose intolerant, which can cause painful cramps, wind and diarrhoea. This is where milk substitutes come in. For those of us that milk doesn't agree with, or if we don't agree with it, there are a range of alternatives to pour over our breakfast cereal. Today, nearly one in five of us choose to drink a milk substitute, and more than a quarter of Brits believe they are healthier than dairy milk. But are they really? We're going to look at two of the most popular, soya and almond. Any milk substitute is going to have to work pretty hard to match it. Take protein, for example. In milk and in soya, there's tons of it. But look at almond, hardly any at all. That's not really a problem for adults. We probably eat too much protein anyway. But for children, protein is critical for energy and growth. And the obvious one is calcium. Now, milk is full of it, as we can see. And we need calcium for healthy bones, muscles, nervous system, and good heart function. So look at the calcium in the milk here. We've got tons in dairy, and we've also got loads in soya and almond, but in dairy, it occurs naturally. In soya and almond, it's been added. And studies show that the natural calcium found in cow's milk is easier to absorb than the fortified calcium found in the soya and almond alternatives. Many people think that dairy milk contains vitamin D. It doesn't. If anything, just a trace. And right now in the UK, milk is not fortified with vitamin D, but many of the substitutes are. Perhaps one of the least known constituents of milk is iodine. Now, most of us run a little low on iodine, especially pregnant women. But studies have shown that children who have low levels of iodine are at risk of lower cognitive development. 
And if you have a look here at our three glasses, you can see that dairy milk is a great source of iodine, but in soya and almond milk, there'll be hardly any. Always check the label because soya and almond milk is often fortified with calcium and rarely with iodine. So are there any other benefits of milk substitutes? Soy milk contains phytoestrogens, which are good for women going through the menopause and for prostate health in older men. There's also an argument that says plant-based fats are better for us than dairy fats, but that's an ongoing debate. So there are some upsides to going for the trendy milk substitutes, but look carefully at what alternatives you take, because milk is a pretty underappreciated wonder drink in itself. Social media is always blowing up with some new diet fad promising to change your life and transform your health. It was the first time that I'd really understood that food could potentially have a powerful effect. Paleo, keto, alkaline, eating clean, you name it, insert name here, diet. Is there actually anything to them? Or is this, a lot of this is BS. If you want to be really healthy, is it time to ditch the diets? Even from time to time, I get caught in the latest craze. I mean, trying to shred for summer, you've seen by my beta pics. <laughs> but sometimes it's hard to tell the facts from the fat. Miracle diets claiming to be based on science have been around for decades. But now new food books and social media are taking us to a whole new level. One of the diets that's been going around a lot is clean eating. I mean, clean eating alone on Instagram has 48 million posts. So what's this all about? Should we all be eating clean? So what does clean eating even mean? A lot of it's about, you know, cutting out refined sugars and processed meat, eating a lot of veg, and sometimes even cutting out meat altogether. And this sounds pretty good, right? Vegetables could be amazing things and they could have an impact on you that I would never even consider. The person who was dubbed the queen of clean who became a major face in this movement is Deliciously Ella, who managed to transform her life from making a number of changes to her diet and lifestyle. I had problems with my immune system and infections and then chronic fatigue. So I spent about six months or so in bed just taking all these drugs and they just didn't have enough of an effect. She, like many others, has gone completely plant-based in order to improve her health, an idea which stems from one book. The first book that I read was The China Study by Colin Campbell, which for me was really interesting. It was the first time that I'd really understood that food could potentially have a powerful effect. What we learned was that diets that contain more animal proteins is associated with increase in cancer rates and heart disease rates. To get these results, Professor Campbell looked at 6,000 people in China, but instead of measuring their animal product intake, he actually measured their cholesterol levels. We had to look at it somewhat indirectly and comprehensively, and we learned, for example, that blood cholesterol was a pretty good indication, and that in turn was associated with the consumption of more animal protein. So what he did here was use cholesterol levels as a measure for a disease, but we know cholesterol levels can be affected by many different things. So it's a real leap to say that animal products are completely bad for you. What I say, this is the goal. And the reason I say it's the goal is not because we have all the science in. I just simply say this is the goal because as we proceed in that direction, I don't see harm occurring. So basically what the science is saying is we should eat more vegetables. Agree, but not to necessarily completely cut out an entire food group. The science is actually pretty complex and your problem with complex is it doesn't often sell as well or come across as sweet on social media. And this is where we can get in trouble by running away with facts. And this is something that Ella agrees with too. For me, plant-based is about based. Do you see what I mean? And therefore you add on to it, you know, adapt it. It's about sharing recipes that start with a base of plants rather than it saying you can never do this ever again, which is not what I'm about by any shape or form. My problem with the word clean is that it's become too complicated, it's become too loaded. Clean has now implies dirty, and that's negative, and we shouldn't have that. And I think it's sad to me that clean has been taken so far out of, I think, how it was originally meant to be used by people. As I said, I haven't used it, but as far as I understood it when I first read the term, it meant natural, you know, kind of unprocessed. And now it doesn't mean that at all. It means diet, it means fad. Like we know, diets come and go. And me, myself, I've been attracted to those get shredded quick diets to get ready for holiday. However, I've also seen the other side when dieting goes wrong. 
Sometimes studying these diets and taking them too seriously can have its own psychological effects and this can lead to medical conditions such as anorexia and bulimia nervosa and these are patients that I see in A&E. Sometimes the way these diets and fads start with real facts and sometimes actual principles can spiral and snowball and get passed around and people can really misinterpret it and social media is actually amplifying it and changing our relationship to food and this can become dangerous. Even Deliciously Ella, who built a massive social media following talking about diets, has been able to appreciate the issues that can happen with social media and how you have to approach it with caution. I think it's up to us to be as responsible as we can be to, to do everything to allow to people not to take it out of context. To me, that doesn't stop at food. That's the whole of social media. Another recent craze I've heard about in recent years is going gluten or grain free. The idea that apparently cutting out grains makes us healthier. So it's a no brainer, right? Should we all be going gluten free? We've been eating gluten and grain for years. However, the gluten free movement is massive, selling millions of books. I saw too many people succumbing to the need for bypass surgery, stents, dying sudden cardiac death, et cetera, heart attacks. So I asked my many patients to remove grains and sugars. Let's see what happens. What he noticed seemed too good to be true. Blood sugars dropped. Many diabetics became non-diabetic. Spectacular things happened. Mm, seems like a bit of a leap. Most of the science actually comes from a study in Italy. However, it doesn't exactly back all of Bill's claims. I respect and, and like some of the aspects of the David. So we're, it's not that I, you know, I'm an enemy or whatever. So I'm, of course, I'll, I'll be ecstatic if he's right. But the answer is much more complex than you can imagine. He found that gluten could be harmful to the gut in many people. However, this is actually people who've already had gut issues. These people tend to be celiac disease sufferers. People I tend to see in hospital. Not everybody eat gluten will be in trouble. So even the scientists who this movement is based on doesn't completely support it. It seems to be such a no-brainer question, but it's not. I mean, many of these free diets, gluten-free, dairy-free, whatever-free diet, these are only really necessary for people who can't process whatever the intolerance is. And these are patients that I see. So when it comes down to it, three doesn't necessarily mean healthy. So my advice would actually be to make small incremental changes to your body and your lifestyle and your diet. Avoid crash dieting, avoid social media, avoid comparisons with people you don't even know, and just focus on yourself, on your body, doing small things to get better each and every day. Does it matter what time I eat? Don't eat carbs, don't eat protein. Okay, actually, no, some protein, but then don't eat fats, uh, unless, unless they're the, the type of fats that are good for you. It's like, what? <laughs> nah, 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 nah. I've had enough. I've had enough. I've had enough. I need a break from all this confusing and contradictory advice about what to eat. What I want to know is, even if I don't change what I eat, but then I change when I eat, can I improve my health that way? So can just changing my meal times actually make me healthier? Now, this experiment looked at the effect of eating breakfast an hour and a half later than you normally would in the morning and then eating dinner an hour and a half earlier than you normally would in the evening, meaning that overnight you had an extra three more hours of fasting. Previous studies on mice and rats showed that by actually bringing their meal times closer together, it actually helped them lose weight and have lower levels of cholesterol and blood sugars. So, we know it works on mice and rats, but will it work on guinea pigs? These 16 guinea pigs were the very first human volunteers to undergo this test in a pioneering 10-week study. They graciously allowed the different types of fats in their bodies, their cholesterol levels, and their blood sugar levels to be measured throughout this experiment. So the blues got to eat their meals as normal, which meant early breakfast eating and eating as late as they liked, including late night snacks. But the reds had their meal times restricted, which meant no late night nibbles for them. So, Dr. John Johnson, pretty solid name if I may say so, ran the study. Me, 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 me. Results are in. Well, it's good news for the restricted time feeding group who ended up looking healthier in some of our measures. <laughs> Firstly, they had lower percent body fat. Secondly, they had lower fasting blood sugar. And thirdly, they had lower fasting blood cholesterol. Wow. 
And that is unanimous, people. And it's actually very interesting because these are major risk factors for a lot of Western diseases, such as heart disease and even diabetes. So tell us, John Johnston, what's going on here? So there are probably two possible explanations for this at the moment. My personal favourite, because of my research interest, is that you're eating at a time of day when your body metabolism rhythms are expecting you to be eating food. So your body can deal with those calories more efficiently than if you eat, um, for example, during the night. However, these guys have also had a longer fasting duration every day. And it may be that the fasting in itself is having some important effects. At the moment, we just don't know, but I think it's great that we're actually seeing some positive results. Now, although this was just a small study, similar results have been produced elsewhere. And basically, the fact is when it comes to metabolism and fat burning, your organs tend to do this when they know there's no more food coming to your body. So if you can increase this period of fasting, mostly when we're asleep, you can actually burn more fats. Now guys, so try not to get too bogged down by this and stick to some super hyper rigid regime. Because at the end of the day, there are things that are gonna get in the way. So the major thing to take away from this is that maybe eating breakfast slightly later and eating dinner slightly earlier can burn you a couple more fats. But I'm not done yet. So, if we know that changing meal times can make this much of a difference, what I wanna know now is, should I be eating before or after? exercise. It's not even about exercising anymore. This is about finding out whether or not we could turn our bodies into more efficient fat burning machines. So brother and sister Josh and Jess were the willing lab rats this time. So what they did was 30 minutes of exercise on an empty stomach. Starving. Ravenous. Dr. Adam Collins then measures how much fat their bodies burn. What we're monitoring here is the fuels that he's burning during exercise. So when you're exercising, you are using a combination of glucose, which is a carbohydrate, or fat. So what we're interested in is the impact of exercise after the exercise is finished, because that's when you do most of your fat burning. So most of the effect of that exercise actually happens in the period after the exercise rather than during it. So then Josh and Jess get their breakfast in liquid form. <laughs> Yummy. To calculate exactly how much their calorific input is. A week later, they basically did the same thing, but this time they ate before exercise. And the results? are a little bit weird because the results were actually different for Josh and Jess. So Josh actually burned 10% more fat whilst exercising on an empty stomach. But for Jess, it was the reverse. She actually burned more fat exercising on a full stomach. This suggests there's actually a difference between men and women. So to test this on a bigger scale, we went back and teamed up with Adam Collins to get 31 volunteers to undergo a four-week experiment. Prior to this, I probably had the fitness levels of a pork scratching, um, but now I feel like a much fitter, much more lively, healthier pork scratching. And amazingly, the results were replicated. So with the women, they actually improved by 22% more after exercising when they'd eaten. But with the men, they actually improved 8% more by exercising before they'd eaten. So what's going on here? Well, it's new findings, so it's still being worked out, but it's believed that it's down to how the different sexes handle the foods we use as fuel, such as carbohydrates and fats. Both men and women will store carbohydrate in muscle, and men have more muscle than women. So they have got a greater capacity to store and utilize carbohydrate. So they're really designed to burn carbohydrate preferentially compared to women. So basically men are generally built to burn carbs. So if we eat before we exercise, we're more likely to burn the carbs than burn the fat. So it's beneficial for us to exercise on an empty stomach, meaning you're gonna be burning more fats. However, for the women, in general, they have more fat than men. So exercising after they've eaten is more beneficial for them for burning fats. So it could really make a big difference when you eat. Equally, it's important to keep a healthy perspective about this. Yes, these are intriguing, very interesting findings and they could be used as a general rule of thumb. However, when the time is right for a late night snack or a late night pizza, you'll know. 
For a decade, Joe's been eating 1,900 calories a day. I've averaged around 2,300. Quite a few of them donuts and burgers. How much do you think you weigh? Ooh, I think probably about 180. Ooh, more than 180. More than Breathe in. Uh, should be around uh, 134, 130. 135, 136. Oh, just have to move it down one notch. 134. Wow. Oh, right on, yeah. We're both in our 50s, and I really don't think we look like different generations, let alone species. So how different are we? Just need for you to relax in there, sit still, no talking. Some of the simplest ways of assessing aging don't need specialist equipment. Oh, this is good. Balance is controlled by your inner ear. <laughs> Okay. As you age, ear structures deteriorate and your balance gets worse. <laughs> One more. You can test it by standing on your weaker leg with your eyes closed. <laughs> How long did I make? 6.59 seconds. That's not very good. Not good at all. The average 55-year-old should manage eight seconds. Near down to, yeah, you're doing well for the average 20-year-old. Over 30 seconds most... Um, 20-year-olds can manage, but it's one of those skills that drops off dramatically. Um, I think you proved the point. <laughs> stop. <laughs> you can stop, yes. Yeah. Luigi's methods are rather more scientific. We did a range of other medical tests, including blood tests. Now he's about to give us our results. It feels a bit like being the headmaster's office, doesn't it? We're waiting for the results. <laughs> Will you get an A star? Will I get a B minus? Luigi's face tells me that what I'm about to hear is not good news. Total body fat in uh, Joseph is 11.5%. This is typical of a super athlete, you know, this 11% body fat, it's, it's very low for a 50, 54, 55 years old mm -hmm. man. Yours is 27.1% fat. A third of your body's fat. Thank you <laughs> <laughs> for making that point so emphatically. Yeah. Um, and he's still not done stuff, talking about my know. fat. The abdominal fat is around 30%. Abdominal fat is really the bad guy. The higher the abdominal fat, the higher the, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, no doubt about it. And it is also a risk factor for cancer. So basically, your cardiometabolic profile, it's, it's not good for your age. I mean, you know, I think, you know, you should do something to improve it. What we can say is that Joseph is not going to de develop cardiovascular disease. It's impossible to develop stroke, myocardial infarction, or heart failure. These three diseases are responsible for 40% of the death now in US and UK. No chance he'll die of that. I mean, one in a million. And if I were to go on to Joe's lifestyle? Yeah. In a year, you are gonna, you're going to be cured. I now understand what Luigi means. It is as if we were two different species. Joe's diet seems to be keeping his organs in pristine condition. My diet is undermining my health and fast. <laughs> 